Right, yeah, thank you very much. So this is joint work with Omar Fazi, David Zuta, and Renato Renner. And our main result here is a theorem in quantum information theory that then turns out to be quite useful for quantum crypto. So for this talk, I'll focus on sort of one particular quantum crypto application just for concreteness, and then we'll sort of make way, work our way towards the, the general theorem. So the example that I want to focus on is something called blind randomness expansion. I'll explain what this is in a minute. And we'll use this to kind of motivate the necessary definitions of quantum entropies and something called a reduction to IID. And then we'll kind of see what's required to prove security of this protocol, and this will then lead us to this general theorem. And one thing I want to stress is that if it is the case that this blind randomness expansion here, currently we only know how to prove using this generalized entropy accumulation, but it's really not the main point. I'm just using this as a running example here for concreteness. Um, we also do one other application in the paper, which is maybe a bit more practical, which is prepared measure QKD, so I'll mention this um, a little bit towards the end. Okay, so what's blind randomness expansion? This is an idea that goes back to this paper of, of Miller and Chi from 2017. And the setup here is that we have one party, Alice, who is classical and who has like a little bit of randomness and would like to make more randomness. But because she's classical, she can't just generate information theoretic randomness herself. So she engages the help of an untrusted quantum party, Eve. And what Eve is allowed to do, or is asked to do, is to prepare some quantum device and send this over to Alice. So Eve can prepare this device, D, here in whatever way she wants. She can entangle herself with the device as well. But she sends this over to Alice, and once Alice receives the device, Alice puts it in a box or in a secure lab, which prevents any direct communication between Eve and the device. And now Alice is going to somehow interact over multiple rounds with this device and with Eve, and it's going to try to extract randomness from the answers of the device. Okay, so for us, it's not really important how this protocol goes in detail. If you're sort of familiar with BIQKD and those kinds of things, you'll correctly guess that they will play some CHSH type game. But all that we need to know here is kind of the high level structure, which is that after n rounds of this protocol, Alice will have some classical information, A1 through AN, one from each round described by some random variable, that is just the outputs that she receives from Eve and the device. And Eve will have some quantum side information that I'm going to call EN after N rounds. This Eve can generate in whatever way she wants. Right? She's, we make no assumptions here. She can use this initial state that she shared with the device. She can use the inputs and outputs generated during the protocol. She can apply any complicated update map. She can just do whatever she wants. And then what does it mean for Alice's output to be sort of random relative to each side information? Mathematically, this means that Alice's output AN here, conditioned on Eve's side information at the end, has a certain amount of entropy. And specifically, this entropy here is something called the smooth min entropy. So if you're not familiar with sort of one-shot information theory, you might have only seen the sort of von Neumann entropy, which is a kind of average case entropy. The smooth min entropy is a kind of worst case quantity, which is necessary in crypto because you don't want to prove that your protocol is secure on average. It should be secure sort of every single time, right? So this is the mathematical task that a lot of information theoretic crypto reduces to bounding these smooth min entropies of one system conditioned on another. But it turns out that it's kind of hard to just bound this min entropy directly. And the addition for why it's hard is that, you know, Alice sort of runs this protocol with these untrusted parties who can run any attack that they want. And in particular, they can run an attack which is sort of correlated or even entangled across different rounds of the protocol. And you need to bound this quantity here against any such possible attack. And this is kind of what makes it difficult intuitively. So given this difficulty, one thing that you sort of might be tempted to do here is to just introduce an additional assumption and the kind of natural thing to do is to just say, okay, let's suppose for the sake of argument that Eve and the device just behave identically and independently in each round of the protocol. This is called an IID assumption. It's, called, it's of course unrealistic, right? There's no reason why in practice um, this should be so, but we can make the assumption in the proof. And how's that assumption going to help us? It's going to help us because if we make it, then after n rounds of the protocol, now Alice's outputs here will have this tensor product structure, right? It's just one random variable copied n times because each round was independent and identical. 
And likewise, if you squat him side information, she just sort of accumulates one side information system per identical execution sort of, of one round of the protocol. So at the end, her side information also has this kind of tensor product structure to it. So how's that tensor product structure helping here? It's helping because there's this theorem which has a sort of slightly Baroque name. It's called the quantum asymptotic equipartition property. What it just says is that if you want to bound the smooth monentropy, oops, is that working? If you want to bound the smooth monentropy of such tensor product systems, then this is lower bounded by n times a kind of single round von Neumann entropy. And this is really useful because the single round von Neumann entropy is much easier to deal with. Now we don't have to deal with any sort of complicated multi-round attacks, right? It's just a single round quantity. So for these blind randomness expansion protocols, you can actually bound this analytically. But more generically, there's a very sort of general numerical technique um, from this paper by Brian Fuzzy and Fuzzy that basically bounds this in sort of whatever setting that, that you might be interested in. Okay, so this is really useful, but it is under this unrealistic IID assumption. So it's not really, you know, you can't just prove it under some assumption and then use the protocol in practice where this assumption is not satisfied. So what we want is we want a kind of thing that looks a little bit like this. It kind of reduces the multi-round thing to a single round thing, but without making this unrealistic IID assumption. Okay, so let's go back to the general case here. As I said before, Alice's output are just n random variables. They may have some complicated joint distribution. E's quantum side information is just whatever she did during the protocol to generate that side information. And now what we're asking for is what is called a reduction to IID. So this is sort of like the, the meta um, proof strategy here. What we want is that the min entropy at the end of the protocol of the outputs condition on the final side information is lower bounded by n times sort of some single round quantity that we still have to determine. And then there will be some kind of finite size corrections down here as well. Okay, so this is the thing that we want to bound, but it's difficult to bound. And this is what is hopefully easier to bound. It's either called a single round quantity or an IID quantity, because if you do it IID, then it's sort of equivalent to just doing a single round. Okay, and our main result, this generalized entropy accumulation theorem, is kind of a, a very general way of performing these reductions to IID. Okay, so to sort of say a little more precisely what exactly this theorem says, we can go back to our protocol and model it in a little more detail. So we already had these systems AI, which are Alice's output systems, and EI, which are Eve's side information systems after the respective rounds. Um, but we also have this device here, right? This, this device that Eve prepared. And this device is also untrusted, and we don't want to make any assumptions about it either. So in particular, this means that the device might have some sort of memory that it uses to remember what it did or what happened in previous rounds, and it will then adapt its behavior based on this memory in future rounds. So we have to account for this by introducing this additional system RI, which describes the device's memory sort of state after round I. Okay, and then with these systems, we can model our protocol just by a sequence of quantum channels. So the first round of the protocol will take as input whatever initial state Eve prepared for herself and for the device. And it will run this through a quantum channel. What does this quantum channel do? It basically you know, simulates the first round of the protocol. So it will like, sample the inputs, just like Alice would sample the inputs. Then it would apply whatever map Eve and the device would apply um, in sort of their behavior. And it would produce Alice's output A1 here, as well as the updated side information and memory registers. Okay, and then we can just keep going, right? This is the first round, but now the output of the first round is used as the input for the second round, and, and so on, all the way up to the end rounds. Uh, one thing I want to point out here is that, of course, these rounds, these channels here, they don't have to be the same, right? We don't restrict um, all the rounds to be identical. And also, we don't actually quite know what these channels are, right? I said the channel kind of implements whatever Eve and the device would do in the protocol. But because Eve and the device are untrusted, we don't actually know what precisely this is. But we'll deal with this at the single round level. So we'll do the reduction to IID for any such map um, MI. And then once you're at the single round level, you can then deal with this fact that Alice only sees classical statistics and so on. So we don't have to worry about this here. OK, so that's kind of the abstract way of describing this protocol. And this is precisely the kind of setting that this generalized entropy accumulation theorem deals with. 
So if you like, you can now forget all about this example and just move to the more abstract setting of having any such sequence of maps that are wired together in this manner. And then what we prove is that for any such sequence of channels, which you know, look like this, and any starting state, rho R0, E0, that you would put in here at the start, the, I'm going to use the mouse, um, the smooth entropy of all of these outputs AN, so the superscript here means all of them you know, concatenated, conditioned on the final side information EN here, but notably not conditioned on the final memory register of the device, this is lower bounded by this sum of a single round quantities minus some finite size corrections. So what are these single round quantities? So let's take I equals two as an example. Then we're looking at you know, the entropy, the von Neumann entropy here of A2 conditioned on E2. And then there's this additional E prime one register, which is some kind of purifying register. There's not like a ton of intuition for this purifying register, um, but it just kind of pops out of the proof and it doesn't cause any problems. Okay, so we're basically like looking at the output here conditioned on this, but then we minimize over all possible input states into the map M2 in this case. So in words, what you should think of here is basically this is the you know, total min entropy of all of the n rounds, and it's lower bounded by a sum of worst case single round von Neumann entropies. Well, worst case because we minimize over the inputs. Okay, so this is what we wanted, right? This is this kind of reduction to IID theorem. Um, but there's one extra condition that we need, which is why there's this white space. And this is quite easy to see. So suppose, for example, that I took all of these outputs A1 through AN minus 1, and I just passed along copies. They're classical, right? So I can copy them. I just passed along copies in these R systems, these internal memory registers. And then in the very last round of the protocol, so this MN, I would just copy all of this information into the EN system. You know, this is like a perfectly valid choice of, of maps right now without any conditions. If I did this, what would happen? Well, this min entropy would be very small, right? Because now the EN system contains sort of copies of basically all of the outputs from the previous rounds. But these single round quantities here, they won't become small because they don't see the R system at all. They don't depend on the R system. And in the prior rounds, this sort of copied information is only passed along in the R systems. So this, without any extra conditions, this simply can't be true because of this sort of sneaking side information along in the R registers problem. So to make this a, a truth theorem, um, we need this additional condition, which we call a non-signaling condition. Um, roughly what this says is that it's meant to prevent this sneaking along thing. And the way this is captured here is it says, suppose you look at you know, one of the maps MI, let's again look at M2, and you trace out the output A2 and you trace out the internal register, so you look at the marginal state on the adversary system, then you're supposed to be able to kind of reconstruct this marginal state on E2 purely from the marginal state on E1. So you're kind of meant to be able to update the marginal states of each side, each side information correctly without looking at the internal memory of the device, and this prevents this kind of copying over, right? Because if I copy over, how am I going to update the marginal correctly without knowing the thing from which I copy? Okay, so that's, that's the actual theorem. There are a number of sort of technical conditions that one can introduce. The most important one is that in many cases you don't actually want to take the minimum of all possible states here, but only if a state would sort of succeed in the protocol in, in some sense. Um, this can be done. It's sort of slightly annoying, but, but it's fine. So I'm just going to brush over this here. Okay, so just to get some practice with this non-signaling condition, um, let's go back to our example and just check that it's true, right? So what, what, is, what is the condition? Here's the condition. We need to update the marginal on each side without looking at the device's memory. How are we going to do this? Well, we can just sample Alice's uh, input to Eve. This is some known distribution. We can do it and then just apply whatever map Eve would apply. And this will correctly update Eve's marginal without looking at the side information because of this sort of physically, uh, physical non-signaling barrier here. Right? This implies that the marginal on each side can't depend on any actions that Alice performs on her side. So in this case, the kind of physical non-signaling constraint imposed by this, this box that Alice has um, kind of implies this information theoretic non-signaling condition. 
they are satisfied, and we've proven the, the security of this protocol. Okay, so that's all I want to say on blind randomness expansion and the kind of general theorem. Let me say a little bit about prepare and measure GKD, which is maybe more practical interest, but is, is sort of theoretically slightly less pleasing. Um, so the setup here is that we have Alice and Bob now who are sort of cooperating and they're trying to generate an information theoretically secure key. And they can do this by exchanging classical information over this authenticated channel, which means it's a channel where Eve can read whatever Alice and Bob send across, but Eve can't sort of inject messages into it and sort of you know, impersonate Alice or Bob. And Alice and Bob have this insecure quantum channel, which is sort of meant to be indicated by these arrows up here. And insecure, he means Eve can sort of intercept any quantum system that Alice sends, modify it in whatever way she wants, and send this on to Bob. And, you know, there are like many protocols for this. The most famous one is this BB84 protocol, which I presume um, many of you have heard of. Um, but again, in proving security here, a kind of very similar thing comes up, where it's much easier to analyze the IID case than the general case. This has slightly different names in QKD, I think largely for historical reasons. So in QKD, the IID scenario is usually called security against collective attacks, and the you know, general scenario is called security against general attacks or coherent attacks. And again, you would want to somehow reduce the, this hard problem of proving security against general attacks to this much easier one of proving security against collective attacks. And we show, it's relatively straightforward to do, that this generalized entropy accumulation theorem can do this in a very generic way without any sort of specific assumptions about the details of the implementation of the QKD protocol. So what we show is that for a pretty broad class of these prepare and measure QKD protocols, Security against collective attacks implies security against um, general attacks, and also the finite size key rates that you get out in this way are sort of pretty good and, and reasonably practical. Um, okay, so I'll have one slide now, which is slightly more technical. It's mostly intended for those who have seen the original entropy accumulation theorem, which is sort of the one of which this is a generalization. And I just briefly want to point out the kind of technical differences um, for those who are aware of it. So this is what we just saw, right? Uh, we're, looking at, we're looking at processes of, of this setup here. We have this non-signaling condition on the maps, and then we prove a lower bound on this conditional min entropy. In the sort of original entropy accumulation theorem, the main difference is the kind of structure of the process is sort of more restrictive. So while here we allow updating of the side information during the process, in this original entropy accumulation theorem, the side information is now this E system, which is generated at the start and then never touched, so it's kind of static. And the side information also includes these I1, I2 through IN systems, which are generated in a kind of round-by-round -round manner, but also can't be updated. They're just output and then they're there. And then there's a kind of Similar condition to the non-signaling one, it's a Markov condition on the side information here, and you prove a lower bound on, on the same sort of quantity. So it's not immediately obvious, but you can indeed show without too much difficulty that you know, this is strictly more general, this non-signaling condition implies this Markov condition, and the main advantage of this generalized version is that because you can update the side information, you can now analyze protocols where the adversary actually sort of actively participates in the protocol rather than just preparing some sort of quantum state at the start and then sitting back and just observing side information as it comes in. Okay, so let me wrap up. Um, our main result is this generalized entropy accumulation theorem, which is a new information theoretic tool for bounding limit entropy of sort of sequential processes of a fairly generic kind. Compared to the EAT, as we just saw, we can now handle processes where the side information is updated during the protocol, which is necessary for these mistrustful protocols like blind randomness expansion and also for prepare and measure QKD. As sort of applications, the one that we've done so far is our prepare and measure QKD and blind randomness expansion. Um, but in terms of open questions, the obvious thing to do is to apply this to more crypto protocols, right? So there are a lot more of these mistrustful crypto protocols where all the parties interacting in the protocol don't trust each other, just like in blind randomness expansion, but you can do this for conference key agreement and all sorts of primitives. And it seems likely that you can apply, again, apply this generalized EAT to prove security of these protocols. 
And you can also go ahead if you're more interested in QKD and analyze much more practical QKD protocols than we did and model all the sort of photonic elements of these and get good finite size Q rates. There are also potentially sort of more speculative applications on the physics -y side, but uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't say anything about that. Uh, you can also try to improve the theorem itself. So there are two sort of main ways in which this is still not quite what you would want. Um, one is you would actually sort of want a version of this which holds for relative entropies, not just conditional entropies. Um, this seems technically very hard to get, but it would be really nice. And finally, sort of a more practical improvement. Um, I briefly mentioned this point of having statistics to constrain the infimum in the, in the theorem. And the way these statistics are currently handled is really kind of not ideal, let's say. So there's a lot of room for improvement, certainly in terms of how nice the proof should be made to look. All right, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tony. Yeah, questions? Um, I, I guess I have two questions of which the first answer might just be no. Um, but could you relate any of the results here to something to do with results about channel capacities? Um, and then the second question is, could you say a little bit more about the speculative physics -y stuff? Um, OK, so the, the question that has no as the answer is the second one. Um, so on the channel capacity thing, um, it's not directly related, but um, there's some relation um, between this relative entropy accumulation and the channel capacity. So in particular, you know, the key technical barrier in proving this relative entropy thing turns out to be a similar thing as the key barrier in proving the strong converse on channel capacities. Um, but it's not like you can use this specifically to to uh, prove channel capacity. So at least as, not as far as I'm aware. Uh, more questions? Uh, right here. Yeah. Jonathan. Um, can you say what the class of protocols are that you can convert a, a proof of the collective security to a general security? Yeah. So um, let me go back to this. So the main kind of so in the paper, we just phrase this in terms of like a template protocol of which you can then write your protocol as an instance. And so the kind of strict answer is whatever you can write as an instance of this. But morally, the key kind of restriction on these protocols is that Eve's attack has to be sequential, which means that Eve kind of receives one quantum system, does something to it, she can keep quantum memory as she likes, but she sort of has to send off the quantum system that she receives before she receives the next one. You can then go ahead and try to like block this to make this a bit more less strict, but that's that's the kind of key restriction here because the the eat really needs the sequential structure on the attack. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, there, uh, Rene. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Um, you had this infimum over this omega, and you said it's annoying but possible to compute. Um, what does it involve, let's say, for BB84? Is it different from the usual things you compute for BB84? Or? So say that last part again. Um, like this infimum over omega. Um, let, let's say I have the typical BB84 security proof. Can I do the same technique in order to make this infimum here, or? Um, so, okay, this, like the infimum is a little bit sort of more intuitive to understand in the device independent scenario. So suppose you do like standard DIQKD, where Eve would prepare the state and distribute it to Alice and Bob, and they would do something to that state. And basically this omega state that you use here is more or less the state that Eve would prepare and distribute, and you're kind of taking the worst case one. Um, the thing I was referring to earlier is that, um, so this is the statistics thing. If you actually do the protocol, Alice and Bob would check that Eve's answer satisfies certain constraints, for example, satisfy the CHSH condition. And only if this is the case for some proportion of the rounds of the protocol would Alice and Bob accept and actually generate a key. So 
what you need to do is you need to sort of restrict this infimum to states which also satisfy the CHSH condition, say, with that same probability. Because if you don't, you'll just get zero, right? If I just take the infimum over all possible states, if we'll just like make a state which is terrible for CHSH, but it's strictly speaking in the set of all states, and, and just never get a, a useful bound. So the, the difficulty is kind of using the statistics that Alice and Bob actually generated over all of the rounds of the protocol and kind of using the sort of average of them on each single round as a restriction in this infimum. Okay, thanks a lot for the discussion. Maybe uh, we should move on to the next uh, speaker. So thanks again a lot, Tony. Yeah, thank you.